So welcome everyone. Tonight will be, we will be halfway through. Can you imagine? <sighs> 22 letters. We will be about, well, we'll be halfway through the class. <laughs> Not halfway through the alphabet, but halfway through the class. Did everyone have a great week? Yes. yes. Happy Independence Day. I said, were you, did you all see the video Sunday that Pastor played? Oh, my gosh. <sighs> you know, about three or four years ago, I... Uh, my stand is collapsing. I, uh, I started saying Happy Independence Day rather than Happy Fourth of July. Because Fourth of July is just a day, a date. But when you say Happy Independence Day, it speaks of the significance of that date. And it, was, it just amazed me how many people... I mean, okay, I don't, I get you might not remember the year, but they didn't even remember what country we, we, we gained, got independence from. And I was like, oh, my, yeah, Mexico. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was amazing that, but that just goes to the education system. It was a foreigner in the U.S. on vacation who was able to say the country we were, we got independence from and what year. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, help us. Have mercy, oh God. <laughs> Have mercy upon your people. <laughs> yeah. But they're not teaching that stuff to the kids here. Okay, I'm trying to get my uh, mic thing attachment adjusted <laughs> in the back. Oh, he is an amazing God. And he has an amazing journey in store for you. No matter where you are on the journey of life, he has an amazing journey ahead of you. And this is the thing. Unlike the rest of the world, our journey doesn't end when we close our eyelids on this side. The journey only gets even more amazing. And it, the incredible wonders that he has in store for us when we cross over, mm, I don't know about you, but I daydream sometimes about what will it be like the first time I see Jesus face to face? What will that be like? And you know that song, I Can Only Imagine? Yeah, I was like, yeah, can't, wh what will that be like? And when you come before the Father, and all that is before you is the wonder of pure, unadulterated, extravagant, overwhelming love. What will that be like? That would be just absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Whew. So... Let's see here. Just amazing. Waiting for, there we go. Seven. So, I want to pray, and then we're going to say our blessing. Oh, Father, we love you. 
And that seems such a poor sentence to say compared to what you are worth. Because you are worth everything. Everything, the full sum of the adoration of every single thing that you created throughout all time and eternity flowing together is only a mere glimpse, a breath, a whisper, a drop in the ocean of all of the praise and adoration and worship that you are due of which you are so worthy. And Lord, we stand on this side <laughs> of the tree of life. We stand on this side of the tree of life, and we thank you for the glimpses you give us of eternity and your overwhelming, absolutely amazing love, the love that was poured out from the throne of grace through the altar of Calvary into our hearts and into this world. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your olive bed, for these little prophets that go before us and give us glimpses and pictures of who you are. <laughs> And we thank you for the hidden treasures that you delight to show us and to reveal to us so that we can gain even deeper and greater understanding of who you are <laughs> and how much you love us. So we thank you for these weeks and this time together as we come to break the bread of the letters of your word mm. so that our souls can be filled with joy and satisfied with your goodness. And we thank you for it in the name of your precious son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, wow. So we will say our blessing. Blessing for learning Hebrew. Blessed is the one who has taught my hand to write and my heart to understand your letters. Ooh. Hmm. So, Bereshit bara Elohim et, the mystery of et, who in the beginning God. And so, I just wanted to show you a couple more pictures, just going back. On bet. Remember bet. Sometimes if bet is written in the middle, if it's written in the middle of a word, there is no dot. But if it's at the beginning of the word, like here in Bereshit and in Bara, then there is a dot. And where there is a dot, it's the harder sound of B, like baby or boy. But if there is no dot, it's a softer sound of V, like very. And so another B word is the word Brit. Anyone heard the word Brit before? <laughs> Brit. Brit. Brit is covenant. 
Brit is the word in Hebrew for covenant. And it's spelt Beit, Resh, Yud, Tav. And so, just to break down a picture in the word Brit, Brit you have the word Bar, which we know means sun. The picture in Yud is that of an outstretched hand. And Tav is the cross. So in ancient Hebrew, it would be the tent, the head of a man, an outstretched hand, and a cross. So here, Bet Resh makes sun, and the hand on the cross. So Brit, Brit is a word for covenant, and the picture in Brit is the sun with a hand on the cross. Now, why would that be? Where would that go back to you? How covenant, where would this picture of covenant go back to? <coughs> Genesis in the beginning, yes. Going back to Bereshit. The Son of God destroy, is destroyed or destroys by his hand on the cross. Right? But where else? What is, a, what is required for a covenant? Blood. And you need at least two parties to make a covenant, right? What is the most famous covenant of which we are heirs? Abraham's covenant. And in Abraham, the covenant, what we call the Abrahamic covenant, who cut that covenant? God the Father and... No, was it Abraham? He and himself. So it was the Father and the Son. So here's the picture. Within the picture of the Son is always a picture of the Father. Because the, fa the son proceeds from the father. And the, because of the home, the f home is where the father is the leader, protector, covering. And then the son comes out of the home. And so the son and the father and the hand on the cross. So Brit covenant speaks again, going back to the beginning, in the beginning. So what it's saying is that Bereshit is basically saying all of creation is based on covenant. We exist. The very fact of our existence is based on a covenant because it says so right here in the beginning. All of our existence. The fact that you exist. The fact that you have a liver. You have eyeballs. You have knee knees and toes and fingernails. The fact that everything exists. Exists because of covenant. Because of the word of God. Because what he spoke. Because again, speech is part of covenant. You... Remember I said that our Bible is a, is a ketubah, the wedding contract? Well, in our Western society where everything's written, we think of, okay, it's a written document, you read it and you sign it. And most of us don't even read those things when we, before we sign them, right? We're, gonna, we're trusting that the people who are having us sign it are going to be operating legally, 
And if they don't, we're trusting that the governmental authorities will protect us from someone operating illegally, right? So most of us don't even read most of those contracts that we sign. Well, in Hebrew times, in, in ancient times, a contract wasn't a contract unless it was spoken. There was no covenant unless it was spoken. You had, so the terms were written, but each party to the contract had to read or speak out the terms of the contract. So, you know, in ancient times, they, when they studied the Torah, you know, like the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers in the temple, they could recite, literally recite the Torah word for word. Can you imagine what that would do to you? If you had the word of God in you that much, breathed on by the Holy Spirit, because you can't have one without the other, right? You stick a plant in soil, if you don't add water, what happens? It dies. It could have the richest soil possible, but if there's no water, it dies. And so it's the same thing with a word. The word is life. It's the soil in which we grow. And then you have to put, you have to add the spirit to bring that soil so that the nutri nutrients of the soil can be transferred to the plant and give it life and nourishment. So you have to have both. But when God created the earth, when he created not just the earth, but all of everything that is, when he created the universe, he spoke it, and he spoke it for a reason. Because again, going back to Bereshit, in the beginning, it was again a part of covenant. If you go through the little booklet, and I do have some of those little booklets here tonight, so if uh, anyone didn't get them last week and you want, I have some after. You can see me after class. But um, so speaking or reciting the terms of the, co of the covenant were, was part, one of the steps of the, co the steps of the covenant contract. And so we talked about the need for the cutting um, of, of blood. There had to be a sacrifice. And we talked about the exchange of names and the exchange of garments. Well, imagine this. Remember I said last week about how when we speak, what's required for us to speak? Breath. So in the Hebrew mind, breath and speech are synonymous because you cannot have one without the other. We think of speech and we look at you know, words on a paper and we think of that as speech because it's, tra it's a translation of the words of our mind. But in Hebrew thought, the, the words on a paper are not, are not speech until they're spoken. And it was the same thing with a covenant when you spoke. The, you could have a contract, but until each party spoke it, it did not come into being. There was, so in a way, because we're made in the image of God, right? So when we speak, then our words bring life. Remember the scripture says, the power of death, life and death are in the tongue. So as we speak, we bring life to things. We can speak life or we can speak death. But he said, choose life. So as he spoke creation into being, he was speaking the language of covenant, and it was God's covenant with creation that he would be a good God and that he would bring good to his creation. That was part of his covenant. And think of it, remember we talked about exchanging names and that God's name, his covenant name is Yahweh, 
which is yud he vav he. So he represents breath. Okay. So when he when he uh, when he spoke or breathed into into Adam, he was exchanging his life for with Adam and giving Adam his life. He was giving his life to Adam as he breathed into him. And then also because hay represents breath, it was as if with the with the wind of his spirit as he breathed into Adam, the hay, the, the breath then became the hay, and he put his hay name into his creation as he breathed into it. Isn't that amazing? I mean, all the levels that you can see, Brit, the sun, his hand on a cross, Covenant, it all comes back to you, covenant. Oh. Everything God does is based on covenant. Oh. And if you did it backwards, <laughs> so if you took the letters, Bet, Resh, Yud Tav, you could say, translate the word covenant, Brit, as the house of the man with a hand on the cross. <laughs> if you translate the symbols of the letters that make up the word Brit, it's the house of the man or the household or the family of the man with a hand on the cross. <laughs> and then I wanted to show you another word. We, last week we covered Dalit. Dalit is the letter D. Dalit. Well, a Dalit word is the word Devar, which is Dalit, Vav, Resh. And it means word. <laughs> now, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word. Right? So, this is Genesis 1, 1. And John one, one, in the beginning was the word. And in Hebrew, that would be Bereshit, et, Ha Devar. Remember, I said last week the word, the H, the He, at the beginning of the word stands for the. So it's Ha Devar.
And I, as I also said, that um, whenever you have a direct object, and that's getting, we're getting into some <laughs> grammar here, you always have the et in front of it. So Bereshit et Hadavar, in the beginning was the word. And the word in Hebrew, in English we think of, we have the ten, what? The ten commandments. What do you think of when you think of a commandment? Law. What? Order. What else? Command. Must do. What happens if you don't do? Punishment, consequences, what else? Sin, you get in trouble. Disappointment. Well, in Hebrew, the word for commandments is very different. The word for commandment in Hebrew would actually be translated words, devarim. It's the ten words. And so the picture in the word word, remember I said devar. So this is what the ancient Hebrew would look like. Dalit, Vav, Resh. So, Dalit means door or way, and what do you do in, with a door? You open and close it, but you also go in and go out. And the what leads you to the door? A path. A path leads you to the door, and the path is the way to the door. So in the word Dalit are all of those senses. Path, door, in, out, open, close, path, way. All of those um, concepts are in the letter Dal Dalit. And so... <laughs> and then vav is a nail or connection, connect, attach, and resh is a man. So the word devar, you could translate through the concepts, is the way of the nail man. Who is a nail man? Jesus. And so if devar is the way of the nail man, then devarim are the ways of the nail man. So the commandments are actually a picture of the ways of the nail man or the Messiah, the one who gave his life. And in the picture of the nail man is what? Sacrifice, Redeemer, the one who gives his life for you. So would that give you a completely different approach or feeling, emotion towards the ten, the ten, I heard someone put it as realities, or the ten attributes, or the ten um, pictures the ten pictures of the path or the ways of the man who redeemed us, who gave his life for us. Would that give you a completely different approach to it as opposed to do, 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 don't, 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 don't or you will get in lots of trouble? <laughs> right? Yes, Betty. It absolutely, it was done out of love, and it is absolutely the protection of love. And on that note, 
I'm going to go to the next picture. Another letter that we covered last week was, hey, yeah, you know that's actually in the, in the scripture? It says, hey, it's Isaiah, I'm not sure exactly, it's the one that talks about um, why do you spend your income on things that do not do not satisfy you but it's actually in there okay so hey so I explained last week that hey we talked about hey at the beginning of a word means the at the end of a word it means what comes from and in the middle of a word it means the heart or the core of that thing. So we had the word of. What is that word? Of. What's the English of of? Father. So you have of and you put the hay in the middle of of and so that becomes a word that would symbolize the heart of Father. And so of with a hay in the middle becomes Aleph, hay, vet. And that becomes Ahav, which is love. And so love is the heart of the Father. And so for us to love, to say we love someone, and that's a word that's used very loosely in our society and culture today. People say we love. Love is actually a covenant word. It's a word of covenant. So to say you love someone means that that's someone that there is a, a spiritual connection to you. And that could be your family, but people break covenants, right? That's why God did not allow Abraham to be part of that covenant because he wanted to make sure this covenant stood. People break covenants. Sometimes we have friends that you meet someone and it's just like your heart goes, oh, and it's like your heart just feels like it's expanding because there's just a connection with that person and, and it, they become very good friends, someone that you feel that you can tell the secrets of your heart to and that you know that they would not judge you for it that they would come alongside you and hold you up and encourage you and strengthen you. Someone who will not let you, who will not be satisfied to see you stay where you are. They won't, they won't condemn you or criticize you for where you are, but they're not satisfied to see you stay where you are, but they want to draw out the best in you and encourage you to grow and press towards the best that you can be. And that is what love means. So when we say we love someone, what it means what it truly means is we have the heart of the Father towards that person. So we would be to them as the Father would be to them. We are the picture of the Father's love in their life. So what does that look like, and what would that mean? We have the ten devarim, the ten commandments. We know what those are, right? 
No other gods, no idols. Honor his name, remember the Sabbath, honor your parents. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no false witness, no coveting. But here's an interesting thing. In Matthew 22, it talks about the scribes and Pharisees, <clears throat> excuse me, were trying to trick Jesus, right? Remember, they were always doing that, coming up with little tests to test him, to try and trip him up so they could catch him in something that they could accuse him of. <laughs> they didn't realize he already knew. Now, here's the thing. In truth, in the right spirit, what they were doing could have been good. Because if he's saying that he's Messiah, right, then he should be examined to see if it is so or not. Remember when, um, I'm sorry? Testing. testing. There is testing. You know, like when you're in school, right, and you, when you finish a grade or you finish an assignment, you have a test, right? The purpose of the test is not to, to make you fail. The purpose of the test is to see to see if you have learned enough of the material for you to have the foundation on which to advance, right? And that is the purpose of a test. So what they were doing was not unbiblical. It was not unscriptural. It was not even against God. But it was a spirit, the intent of their heart. And what does the word say? God doesn't judge us by our actions, but by the intentions of our heart. And he know, those are the ones he alone knows. Because he said, even I cannot judge my own heart. So, but he can judge the heart of man. So, the interesting thing, they'd asked him about you know, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Why do you think they asked him that question? Try to trap him. But the thing is, if he spoke against Rome, against Caesar, that would be an automatic, he's off their hands, he's in jail, or he's executed for speaking against Rome. Right? So that trick didn't work. So then they had to resort, resort to the law, the Torah. And when we get to Tav, I'll teach you some more about what Torah really means. But um, so then they asked him, which is the most important commandment? Right? That was a question. So we have the Ten Commandments, right? Well, those are the we would call those the top ten, or the top hit parade, because there are actually 613 commandments. We know the top ten, right? The hit parade of commandments, the first ten, that are given in Exodus and again in Deuteronomy. But here's the interesting thing. When Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment he didn't quote any of those ten. In fact, he didn't quote any of the 613. Rather, he quoted from Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. So when he was asked, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? His answer was, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And that's from Deuteronomy 6.5. And then he said, a second is like unto it. Or there is a second commandment that is equally important. And that he quoted from Leviticus 19.18. Leviticus 19.18.
which says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that whole scripture actually, verse actually says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Now, isn't that interesting? Because if God doesn't do anything by accident, and that, that word that he gave through Moses, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And it was like he put this huge exclamation mark on it. I am Yahweh. So I'm telling you, as Yahweh, love your neighbor as yourself. He's in equating loving your neighbor as yourself to associating that with I am Yahweh. And if love is the heart of the Father, loving your neighbor as yourself is the heart of the Father, and Jesus said that the command to love your neighbor as yourself is equal to or is equally important as the first commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. So with all your will, with all of your emotion, with all of your intellect and thought, with all of your physical being that you are to love, everything that he gave you, you are to give back to him in love. Right? And, but then he says, and the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, to love your neighbor as yourself. And in John you know, John was the apostle that t spoke the most about love or the, one, the passages that we know about, most about love. And in his epistle, he said, God is. So you would actually have that in Hebrew. Yahweh. Ahav. God is love, because in, remember, as I said, in Hebrew, there is no verb for is or to be. It is implied. They, so, again, remember we talked about how at the beginning I said that everything goes back to God. Everything points to God. And so the implication in the fact that there is no verb to be in Hebrew, here's the implication. If it is, it's because of God. So if there is anything that exists, it only exists because of God. And so the very fact that there is a thing implies that there is God. Because the thing cannot be without he who is. He who is, he who is all is. Because rem the word, the, um, remember in... Uh, when he spoke to, Mo to Moses, when he called him at the burning bush, he said, in, in, the, in our Bibles, in the English, it doesn't say Yahweh. It doesn't even say Lord. In your Bibles, just an FYI, if you see Lord written with all capitals, that means that it is the word Yahweh in the Hebrew. So if you ever see it written with all caps, that means it's, so if it's capital L with lowercase o-r-d, then it may be one of the other names of God. But if it's the Yahweh, then it is always all uppercase l-o-r-d. But, when, he, but in, um, when they talk about it in the incident with the burning bush, he doesn't say, I am Yahweh. In our Bible, it doesn't, in our English Bible, it doesn't say, I am Yahweh. It says, I am who I am. Right? It says, I am who I am. And what that means in the Hebrew is, I am the, I am the is. 
and all being and all existence is in me. So in Hebrew, when anything is that is, it's because he is. I'm sorry? How did they get the A and the E in what? Yahweh? Well, that's a whole other class. <laughs> on how the pronunciation, uh, what's the correct pronunciation of Yahweh. That's a, that, that take a couple hours just by itself. <laughs> no, it's going to take too long. I'll just say this. That's how it's supposed, that's how it, they believe it's pronounced is Yahweh. We get Jehovah because they took, there's a whole commutation from Hebrew to Latin to Greek to English to from uh, Old English to New English to get from, to German to get from Yahweh to Jehovah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole long linguistic travel there to get from Yahweh to Jehovah. But the syllables are Yehovah, Yahweh. So, Deuteronomy 6 5. So, we're, again, we're still looking at Devar or Devarim, the words. And Jesus said, the first or primary word, devar, commandment, is, Deuter is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And that summarizes the first four commandments. So in the first four commandments, which are... No, you, no other gods, no idols, honor his name, remember the Sabbath. Those would all be summarized in that one commandment, to love the Lord your God with all of you. And then the second that he said that was equal to it, to love your neighbor as yourself, is basically a summary of the last six commandments because the last six are all about our relationship with our neighbors. And again, even in the Hebrew, the word neighbor implies covenant. Friend implies covenant. So in, in quoting Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18, Jesus was revealing Ahava, love, the heart of the Father, and that the instructions or words, Devarim, were not a list of do's and don'ts, but rather a revelation of the love of God. So, we have done six letters. We're going on to the seventh. And now we've got to pick up the pace. <laughs> so the seventh letter is Zion. And so what do you think is the numerical value of Zion? Seven. Now, there are several letters that look very similar. I'm going to write them out here. So you have Vav, which is a straight line with a short tail on top. You have Yud, which is a short line with a tail on top. And then you have Zayin, which is a long line, like the Vav, and instead of having a tail on top, it has a cross piece at an angle. Zayin. Zayin, and it's a Z sound, and its numerical value is 7.
Magnífica. So, and the Zion was a picture of a sword. Yes. It was a sword or an axe head. So, <laughs> you better behave. Now the commandments come out. <laughs> so, Zion, sword. What do you think of when you think of a sword? Slice, stab, cut, kill. I heard what did you say? Warriors? Warriors and wars? <laughs> what else? Weapon, wor the word. I'm sorry. Heels. Heels. Power. Authority. Protection. Authority. Protection. Might. Strength. Who wields the sword? Soldier. Leader. Attack. <laughs> God wields the sword. Bloodshed. Angels yield a sword, wield a sword. Armor bearers. Watchmen, yes. Think biblical times. Kings. There we go. Kings. Your tongue. Yes. <laughs> the tongue. <laughs> the sword. So, the symbol, as I said, was a sword or an axe. And the symbolic meaning, as you've drawn out, was to cut, to cut off a weapon but also spiritual, spirituality and the purpose of creation. <laughs> God created the physical world in six days, but he did not complete his work of creation until the seventh day when he gave Shabbat or Sabbath, which reminds us of our relationship and dependence on God. So, he created all that we see, all of creation, in six days. But his work of creation was not complete until he gave the Sabbath. Because otherwise, we would be all about work and there would be no rest. And if we're made in his image then we should follow his lead. And so he's setting a pattern that there's work, but there also needs to be rest. And then what did he tell the Israelites about the Sabbath? 
the sa- that's a command, but what was the purpose of the Sabbath? It says the Sabbath was a sign of the covenant between God and Israel. When we take partake, yes. So the Sabbath was a sign. It was like God's signature on his handiwork of creation because it was a sign. He says the covenant is a sign. I mean, sorry, the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant that was to be uh, observed perpetually between him and his covenant people. And we also as heirs of Abraham, are also his covenant people. And so, again, that's why there's also the concept of spirituality and the purpose of creation. Because in Sabbath, in the, in the seventh day, he gave the purpose of creation, which was to have communion with God. Right? The numerical value of Zion is seven, and seven represents spirituality and is a very important number in the Jewish religious calendar. There are seven days in a week, which culminates in Shabbat, and the root of the word Shabbat also implies seven. The feast of Passover, which is Pesach in Hebrew, is seven days long, as well as the Feast of Sukkot, which we call the Feast of Tabernacles. There are seven weeks from Pentecost to, I'm sorry, from Passover to Pentecost. And every seventh year is a Sabbath year in which they were required to allow the land to rest. And there are seven Sabbath years to make up a year of Jubilee. Shemitah, <laughs> seven. The word Zion is translated weapon, but Zion is also for Zan, which means sustainer. It may seem odd, it seems would seem odd to me, and maybe to you, that the same word or letter would represent both a weapon and as well as a sustainer. Wouldn't it seem to you? (laughs) So, Zayin and Zan. And here's the other letter, the final N, or Nun Sofit, looks just like the Vav, except that it, co- it has a much longer tail. So this is Zayin, and this is Zan. And so the only difference between Zayin and Zan is Yud. So, the same letter means both a weapon that destroys as well as a sustainer that builds or constructs and heals. But scripture makes this very comparison. In Joel 3.10, it says, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. As well as Micah 4 3, it says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So he's making that comparison in the scripture about the thing. And like Glenn said, once you get it, you have to be able to keep it. And the weapon or the sword 
is a protection to help you protect what the Lord has given you. When we deliver, yes, when we say we deliver, we, we say we are breaking off or cutting off. Which would then be zayin. And then another zayin word is the word zar, which is zayin and resh. What does that sound like? What word do we know in English? Czar. Czar. The picture in czar. So you have zayin, which would be weapon or war. And resh, that was man. So, czar is a weapon man or a man of war, and it means enemy. And then another, we talked about this, all the sevens in Scripture and how seven is so um, symbolic and so pivotal in the Scriptures. So we t talked about the six days of creation that, are cul that culminate in Sabbath, in the seventh day, the Shabbat. And so they, they talk about Shabbat as being the crown of creation. So it talks about... Shabbat being part of creation, part of the creation process, and being the crown, the thing about all of creation. And why would that be? Because Shabbat is all about communion. Communion with our creator. And here's another interesting thing about Zion or seven. And then also spiritually, we think of Zion or seven as being the number of fulfillment or completion, right? Because the work of creation was completed with Shabbat on the seventh day. Here's another interesting thing in scripture that we, we completely miss in English. We have the word in English, praise, right? And it's all over Scripture, all throughout Scripture, the word praise. In Hebrew, they're actually, get this, seven Hebrew words for praise. There are seven Hebrew words for praise, and each one has a different meaning. And I have a couple cards here that talks about the seven Hebrew words for praise. This is from Selah Ministries by Ray Hughes. And he ha if you've never heard of Ray Hughes, he has an amazing, amazing teachings uh, and revelation on praise and music. He was a minister of music and a pastor and a itinerant speaker and teacher for years and years, but the God, God has given him an amazing revelation on the ministry of music, the ministry of worship, and praise in the, in the scriptures. But he has this little card on the seven Hebrew words for praise. And I'll just list them here for you. So the seven Hebrew words for praise. One we know very well. Mm 
No, I'm talking a Hebrew word. Hallelujah. Halal. Halal. Halal is to praise, and it means to boast, to shine, to praise, to make a clamorous proclamation. And to act madly. Act. To act madly. The next <laughs> Hebrew word for praise is yada. And we do this quite often in worship. One of the things that we do in worship. It's a lifting of hands in honor and reverence. Yada. In thankfulness, honor, and reverence. The next word is barach. And barach means to kneel or to salute. The fourth word is tehila. Tehila means a spontaneous song of praise. Tehila, T E H I L L A H. Tehila. And the fifth word is zamar. Z A M A R. And zamar means to record, to make music, to pluck to pluck the strings, to pluck an instrument, or to strum. And then the next word is toda, T-O-W-D-A-H. And toda means to give thanks, an expression of praise in thanksgiving. And then the last one is shabach. And shabach means to exclaim, to shout, to laud, to praise with shouts of joy. So, again, Zayin, seven, seven Hebrew words for praise in the scripture. And then, what is the other seven that we know very well in scripture? In Revelations, Toda is to give thanks. Barak means to kneel or salute. The, the seven candlesticks, the seven lampstands of the seven churches in Revelation. Now, see, in, remember I said at the beginning of class that when we come in here, we have to take off our Western mindset hat and take on a Middle Eastern mindset. So, you know, in our Western Greek thinking, if we say seven, we mean count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there are seven, and it's only seven, right? We would not think that if it says seven, that there could be 50 or 120 or any other number other than seven, right? You wouldn't think that, right? But that's because we're thinking Greek. We think in concrete. If it says seven, then it must be seven. It can't be eight. It can't be six. It has to be seven because it's seven. But... Remember, Hebrew is a symbolic language. So when it says seven, maybe there are only seven lampstands. But maybe what the seven lampstands represent is the fullness of the church, the fullness of the body of Christ, the fullness of the body of Christ. Okay, because seven represents fullness. The fullness as in a jar that is completely full. That's the fullness or it's zayin or fill total to the top 
It's because remember in Revelations, the, the saints cry out to the Lord and say, how long, O Lord, how long before you avenge us? And he says, until the fullness. So it's a thought. Don't build any doctrines on it. I'm not saying that's scripture, but it's a thought. You know, just to get you thinking beyond those concrete cement walls of our Greek Mindset that everything is chuck, 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 chuck. so Zion seven. That seventieth jubilee. Remember, God thinks God thinks different from man thinks. Right? He says, for your thoughts are not my thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so far are my thoughts above your thoughts. But he gives us a glimpse of how he thinks in the Hebrew, where everything has layers and layers and layers and layers of meaning. Because he's communicating, how do you take a message to communicate that is relevant to 6,000 years of history of humanity that can translate from nomadic agricultural society to uh, urban industrial society and post-modern age, post-industrial age, post whatever is coming next. How do you create a language that transcends culture? You speak in symbols, and symbols always have multiple layers of meanings. And <clears throat> symbols also have cultural meanings. When I say dog, what do you think of? A pet? What else? Hunter, a friend, a what? Protector, flea carrier. <laughs> what else do you think of? Furry, soft, cuddly little puppy. You want to hold them, you want to cuddle them. They look so cute. So if, we, if I said a symbol to you of dog, would that be a positive or a negative for everybody except Glenn? Would that be a positive or a negative connotation? Positive. <laughs> for another reason. They run in packs. They go bad together. <laughs> they, they can. <laughs> But in um, African cultures, a dog has very negative connotations. They're thought of like we would think of buzzards, scavengers. Um, it's all negative. Ugly, Ugly yeah. The, it, they're predators. They're dangerous. They're they wouldn't think of having a dog in their home, you know, as a pet. It would be inconceivable. Yes. <laughs> so you say, much. she said, she understands completely. She's from that background. So symbols have, have meanings that translate more than just what the object is. So we're going to move on to our next letter, which is Chet. Oh, before we move on to Chet, here's a messianic picture in Zion. Zion is a picture of a weapon or a sword, and one of the messianic titles for Jesus is Prince of Peace. 
In Hebrew, this title is Sar Shalom. Sar Shalom. The little dots. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so this is a letter sheen, as in shalom. If the dot is on the right, then it makes the sh sound. If the dot is on the left, it makes an s sound. And when we get to the sheen lesson, I'll show you how significant that little dot is. <laughs> So this is Sar Shalom. So in the picture, so here it is, Sar. I'm going to write it in the ancient script, which is like teeth. So what do you do with your teeth? Tear, bite, destroy. So Sar, I'm sorry? Bite the head. So Sar is a picture of a man of destruction. <laughs> so does that kind of like make your head go tilt? The man of destruction who brings peace. Why is that a good thing? Sometimes it's good to destroy. We tear down and destroy the works of the enemy in the world. Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And he is a Prince of Peace who comes, he's a man of destruction or a man of war who brings peace. And in Joshua 5.14, he says he is the captain of the hosts of the Lord. Jesus is also known as the Word of God. And scripture says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even to dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thought and attitudes of the heart. And that's Hebrews 4.12. And also in Revelation 19.15 it's a picture of the man with a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. Okay, Zai. So now we're going to go on, continue our journey to the next letter, which is Chet. Chet looks like hey, except hey has a window, and chet is closed. Has no window. Chet is a picture of a fence. And it's the eighth letter. So what do you think the value is? Eight. <laughs> new beginnings. Why, is it, why would you get the concept of new beginnings out of eight? Because we already had the seven completion. So if you've completed or fulfilled it, what comes after that is a new beginning starting over. So... What pictures or what sense would you get from uh, a fence? Protection, what else? Boundary? Boundary, border, what else? Hedge? What else? Limitation. Anything else? I'm sorry? Refuge. Okay, yes. 
What else? Protection? Yes. Blockage? Wait, wait, what did you? Inheritance? Territory? Hold on, somebody had something else back here too. Territory, what else? What's that? Authority? I'm sorry? Divide? Okay. I'm sorry? Prohibit? Anything else? A wire, a prison? <laughs> ah, so let's think of eight new beginnings. What else comes with new beginnings? What's another term? How else do we say new beginnings? Start over. What else? Rebirth. New day. New day, new life. New life, week. Renewal. Conquer. Birthing. All of these things in one little symbol. I'm sorry? Well, it, the eight on its side is a symbol for infinity because, again, it's Covenant, yeah, who said covenant? <laughs> covenant, yes, remember what we said about cutting the covenant, one of the steps of cutting the covenant was to walk away from each other and then come back together. And the, you did that starting in the midst of the animals. So you had the dead animals cut open in half on each side of you. You stood in the middle back to back and walked away from each other. So what you were literally saying is, I am now dead. As those animals are dead, I am dead. And I walk away from that life, that dead life, and I come and return to newness of life. And see, the word repent, in the word repent, is the idea of turning around or turn or return, as in return to God. Because where do we come from in the first place? From God. So when we are born again... We walk away from that old life and the old man and we return to God. Huh? A new chapter, a new beginning. If that's also what? The water baptism, yes. The newness of life. So... Chet is also for chen, and you say chet kind of like bach, that like you're scratching your throat or clearing your throat. Chet is for chen, chen. So chet nun, chen, which means grace. And so the picture in Han 
It is God's grace that gives us a chance to be born again, giving us a new beginning and a new life in him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. And again, covenant. The old has passed away. I'm leaving the old behind. And I'm entering in to a new life. <laughs> and Revelations 21.5, he says, Behold, I make all things new. Chet is also for Chaim. And so here, going back to Chen, Chen, Chen is Chet and Nun. Nun symbolizes life. And Chet symbolizes fence or protector. So God's grace is the protector of life. And then another word, another chet word is the word chaim. Which is chet, yud, mem. as in the God-breathed life that sustains us. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of chaim, or the breath of life, and man became a living being, a being chai. There's an interesting thing <laughs> in uh, in the scripture, when it's talking about life or man, when it's talking about human beings, there are words that are in there that have a double yud. And it has the exact same meaning whether it has a double yud or a single yud. But the double yud always applies to when it's talking about man. The single yud is, form is used when it's talking about everything else in creation. So is there a difference between a man and a dog or a tree? Yes. We don't get it in English. And therefore, you have all of this confusion about, oh, tree huggers and save the trees. And yes, we're supposed to be stewards, showing the heart of the Father and the love of the Father for all of his creation. But there is a principle that is seen in the scriptures, in the Hebrew only, that you only see in the Hebrew and when it's in that passage of Genesis, when it talks about and Adam became a living being, it is Chaim with two Yuds. And then also in uh, Genesis 2, there are two places. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So there are three times in there, there are two times in there, there's the word hai or chaim. So the breath of life, ruach chaim. And then a living soul, 
which is a nefesh chai. Nefesh is soul in Hebrew. But then the word in Hebrew for formed is the word vayitzer. It's actually yetzar is the infinitive form, but it's yud Okay, Yud Sadi Resh. Yetzar. But when it's talking there in the Hebrew, when it's taught in Genesis 2 7, when it says, and God formed, the word Vayitzar or Yetzar has two Yuds in it in the Hebrew. But later in Genesis 2.19, and it says the same thing. And out of the ground the Lord God formed, but this time it's talking about the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam. And here it's the same word, yetzar, but in the Hebrew, it's only spelt with one yud instead of two. So when it's talking about the life or the forming of man, yud has to do, the double yud has to do with the symbol, the spiritual side of man. In his likeness, and that's right, because he says that twice. And now we see it, in the English, and we say, oh, he's just repeating himself. But it's two different words. And when God says something, it's not a mistake. He's not just making up words for the sake of saying words. So he says, let us form man in our image, in our likeness. Let us make him male and female, made he them. So when he says in his likeness, that's one yud, and in his image, that's a second yud. But we're talking about chet. <laughs> chet and chai and chen and chaim. Lechaim, the toast that they see, they say in. Uh, Jewish circles and Hebrews, lechaim to life. And you'll see they'll have like pendants and jewelry and stuff. And it will, it'll be the chet with a yud, which is chai, which also means life. Now chet is also for what was Adam's wife's name? Eve. We know her as Eve in English, right? But in the Hebrew, her name is actually Chava, which is Chet, <clears throat> Vav, He. Chava. which is Eve. Of whose daughters? Who's Reptavia? Oh, pro yes, yes, I think it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Genesis 3.20 says, And the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And so, Chava is
So Chava, this is what the letters would be. The fence, the nail, and the man in the window. And remember, He at the end means what comes from. Right? So what comes from, what does a nail do? It makes secure. So, what comes from a secure protector or secure protection? What comes from or behold, see the secure protector? And we think about, we think of women in Western culture, we think of women as being the frail, the weak, the need to be protected. But we're daughters of Eve, daughters of Chava, and Chava means what comes from or see the secure protector. See or behold the secure protector. She came out of his body. Yes, that's Isha, because woman came out of man. But in the Hebrew concept, a husband, what do we talk about as a, a husband as being to a woman or his family? Head, but what does he do? do? Covers. So here's the picture. The husband comes and covers. But the wife comes and protects. So the, the husband covers and the woman encompasses or surrounds. So the husband covers, he comes over to protect from attacks from above. And the wife is a picture of the strong or, sur st strong or secure wall of defense surrounding to protect from attacks from the side. And chet is for chokma. Which is wisdom. Is that you? which is Chet, Yud, Kaf, Mem, He. Chokma. <laughs> and you, you know what I'm going to start doing? I'm going to start doing KH for that <laughs> sound instead of CH, because you see CH, you're used to it being a ch sound. Chokma. <laughs> Wisdom. And so the picture in Chakma, again, the He on the end means what comes from this. And so here is the protector, the protector that nails the hand of chaos. 
Wisdom is a protector. And then our last het word. Het, het. is for ach. For ach, which is aleph, chet. Now, so, Aleph het. So what's Aleph? Ox, but what does it symbolize? What does it, an ox symbolize? Strength. And het is a fence or protector. So, ach is a strong protector. Guess what word that is? Brother. The word for brother is ach, which is a picture of a strong protector. So in Genesis 4-9, when Yahweh asked, asked Cain where his brother Abel was, and Cain replied, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes, because you are the strong protector or the primary defense is what a brother is. And so Cain, <laughs> in Hebrew, it's Cain. Which is Kuf, Yud, Resh. And Abel, in Hebrew is actually Hebel, which is He Bet Lamed. And so the picture in Cain or Cain is Kuf represents righteousness, so it's a righteous hand. <laughs> The righteous hand, oh, I'm sorry, this is not Oresh. Cain is Kuf Yud Nun. So Cain is the righteous hand of life. Abel, or Hebel, is Behold the Family Shepherd. So righteous hand of life who is the strong defender of the family shepherd? Where is the family shepherd? The family shepherd was slain by the hand of the righteous hand of life. By his own brother who was to be his strong defender. I'm just talking about Cain and Abel. 
And I'm talking about the pictures in the words in the passage when God said, when he called Cain, Cain, he's saying, righteous hand of life, who is the strong defender of the, shepherd, the family shepherd, where is the family shepherd? The family shepherd had been slain by the hand of the righteous hand of life. In the, in the question was the condemnation. And, and so in the question, God already, in the Hebrew, it's saying the question contains the knowledge of what happened. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes! You're the strong defender. You're the first defense. You're the primary line of defense for the, your brother. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. No, Cain does not represent God. No, Cain does not represent God. What it is, it's showing that he was called to be a righteous man who brought life but because of sin, he brought death. And that is us. Cain is a picture of us. We were created to be righteousness in the earth and to bring forth life. But because of sin, we bring forth death until we meet the nail man. And when we meet the nail man, then we fulfill our calling as being the righteousness of God, the righteousness of life. He is the God of all life. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. I'm going to move through this one a little quickly. So we can try and get to Tet. Before, I mean, to Yud. So the ninth letter of the alphabet is Tet. So we had, bless you, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zayin, Chet, and Tet. Tet is a ninth letter. <laughs> It was a picture of a coiled snake. So what would you think of when you think of a snake? Strike, what else? Danger? Sin? Venom, sin, what else? Deceiver? Evil? What else? What? Conniving. Conniving. Deception, we have that. What? There are two kinds of snakes. You have, there are two types of snakes. One is poisonous or venomous, and what are the other class of snakes? There are no... <laughs> What kind of snake is a python? It's a constrictor. So to constrict or to surround.
the numerical, it is a ninth letter, the numerical value is nine, and the symbolic meaning is to surround, coil, twist, to make muddy or unclear. <sighs> and so it is interesting that the letter chet, which can symbolize sin, as in, we said, divide, keep out, boundary, and also the letter tet, which can also symbolize what is muddy or unclear, appear does, n does not appear, neither of these letters appear in the names of the sons of Jacob. None of, their none of these letters appear in the names of the sons of Jacob, which are Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulon, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. And so neither of these letters, neither Tet nor Chet, are in the names of any of the sons of Jacob. So what, does, what would that tell you? They're not dangerous. But that's also a prophetic declaration from God over their lives and their purpose in the earth that there would be no sin found in them. And Israel is also a picture of Messiah because you could say that Israel is to the world what Messiah is to the world because Israel brought forth the Messiah, and through Abraham, through Israel, through Abraham's descendants, Messiah came. They were the ones that were entrusted and charged with the preservation of the Word of God. And, you know, when the dead, the miraculous thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls, everybody remembers when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was 2,000 years old. It was the oldest manuscript of the scriptures that had been discovered up to that time. And the thing that they, the, this was a miraculous thing about it, was that they, the entire scroll of Isaiah, there were two letters different, between what they have today versus what was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the two letters made no difference in the meaning of the passages. But here's the thing with Hebrew. When, they, when, they, when the scribes write out Hebrew, they write the letters and they, they don't spell check in Hebrew. They math check. So each line of scripture has a numerical value. So they're not checking, they don't check the letters, they check the values of the numbers that e make sure that, each, that the letters they have written add up to what the value of that line is supposed to be. You mean the Bible code? No, not, not that specifically. But they don't, so they don't spell check. They math check, make sure the values of the letters add up to what it's supposed to be. <laughs> also, there is no tet in the first five of the Ten Commandments, which speak about our relationship with God. But there is a tet in the second five of the commandments, which speak about our relationship with one another. Tet is also the word for mud, which reminds us that we are made from the mud of the earth, molded and shaped by the hand of God. Tet also symbolizes goodness because the word for good in Hebrew is tov, which is tet, that. So, tet can symbolize what is surrounded or what is on the outside, 
what surrounds or what's on the outside. And that can symbolize the tent or what's in it or what's on the inside. So the picture in Hebrew of tov or good, what is good, is when what is on the outside is equal to what is on the inside. Psalm 34, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. And at the end of each day of creation, except the first day, God pronounced his creation was good. And on the sixth day, when he created man, he said it was very good, or tov meod. And so Tov is a picture of the good man whose heart or what is on the inside is the same as what you see. It's like we say, what you see is what you get. As opposed to the double-minded man who is unstable in all his ways. And we're at 8.30, and I have Yud to go, and that's going to take a little while, so we're going to have to wait for next week for Yud. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your amazing grace. And we thank you for your blessings upon us. We thank you for the pictures of Messiah, our Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah, that you reveal to us through your letters. And we thank you, Lord, that your word will go down deep in our hearts to renew, sustain, and mature us in every way that brings you delight in your good pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I will say this blessing over you, a blessing for peaceful rest and for good sleep. So blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who makes the band of sleep fall upon our eyes and slumber upon our eyelids. And may it be your will, O Lord my God, the God of our fathers, to let us lie down in peace and to rise up again in peace. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. May he smile his grace and blessing down upon you and grant you his shalom. Amen.